So today, because uh, the rest of the teachers won't be able to uh, hold their classes, so we're going to have a longer class, of course. <coughs> Our class will take uh, its own time and then if you have any questions uh, that of course I can answer <clears throat> I will be more than happy to uh, answer your questions <clears throat> if someone wants to participate in any theory idea he or she has uh, his or she uh, are more welcomed to actually share their ideas with us. A'udhu billahi al-sami'a al-alim min al-shaytan al-lahin al-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah Adada ma ahsa'uh al-muh Wa salatu wa salamu ala Muhammad al-Rasulillah Wa ala alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin لا سيما بقية الله الحجة من الحسن فله أرواح العالمين واللعن الدائم والأبدي على أعدائهم أبد العابدين ودهر الداهرين <تصفيق> اللهم كل وليك الحجة من الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى أضائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا <تصفيق> حتى تسكنه أدرك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا <coughs> so, in our hadith class, we discussed too many things which we believe uh, were very important and vital for us to be able to understand and comprehend hadith <coughs> and also to be able to analyze ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, especially in distinguishing between legitimate hadith and fabricated hadith, <coughs> authentic hadith and non-authentic hadith. So, one of the main points that we have mentioned is if we are in doubt, and I'd like you to focus on this uh, part of my sentence if we are in doubt in other words if we are not in doubt <clears throat> for any reason for instance if you hear a narration of a merja <clears throat> of a scholar of one of the for instance if we live in the if we were living in the era of ma'sumin alayhum salam ahl al-bayt alayhum salam if we hear narration of uh, or from Zurara for instance uh, we shouldn't have any doubt however if we have any doubt and we live in the era of Ma'asumin alayhum salam <coughs> what should we do of course so having doubt and above that we should be living in the era of Ma'asumin alayhim wa This is the, 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 the most certain uh, situation that we have to analyze to try to distinguish between authentic hadith and fabricated hadith. So if we live in the era of Ma'asumin, and I'll tell you why, and if we have doubt in a narration. We have to take that narration and compare it with the holy book of Quran or we have to compare it <clears throat> with the prophets uh, authentic sunnah and ahadith and narrations. So why if we are in doubt because if you're not in doubt you don't need to do anything you have to accept the hadith because you're not in doubt. <clears throat> Why if we are in the era of Ma'asumin? Because too many of Ma'asumin and their companions and scholars has, have put actually their efforts 
to distinguish between authentic hadith and non-authentic hadith. In other words, what we have in our books these days, such as Kitab al-Afstafsar, Kitab Man La Yahdur al-Faqih, Kitab, some of Sheikh al-Saduq's books, and some other books. What we have in these books, in these encyclopedias, uh, <clears throat> have been actually uh, tested not only by scholars, but by Ahlul Bayt's companions. Not only by Ahlul Bayt's companions, but also by Ahlul Bayt salam, themselves. As if you can remember a narration I read uh, to you uh, a few weeks ago, when Imam al Rada and also Imam Sadiq <coughs> saw some books of uh, previous A'imma, their fathers, and they distinguished between fabricated hadith and authentic hadith. So too much work, too much effort has been uh, done, actually, has been put to distinguish between authentic and non-authentic hadith. So if you go, let's say, to Kitab Usul al-Kafi <coughs> and open the book of al-Kafi or Al al-Sharaif or Astafsar, or Kamal al din <clears throat> and you start to read a narration, you don't have to normally to have any doubt in any of those ahadith, normally. Yes, sometimes there might be some ahadith that we might be not, not that sure about those ahadith, and we'll talk about it, those ahadith as well. So what Ahlul Bayt salam said, to actually compare between Ahadith and the Holy Book of Allah to compare between Ahadith, doubted Ahadith, and actually narration of narrations of the Prophet, those narrations that we are 100% that they are authentic, such Hadith al thaqalain such as Hadith al thaqalain <coughs> is actually what Ahl al salam said, uh, is targeting doubted Ahadith. Not normal hadith, not a hadith that we are not actually in doubt about them, such as our hadith. So, we have to compare between those hadith and the Holy Book of Allah and Sunnah al Nabi, and we explained how should we do that because to understand Quran we have to go to a hadith and to distinguish between authentic and non-authentic hadith we have to go back to Quran so some people might think that there is a contradictions between uh, these two uh, <clears throat> method and ideas no there is no contradictions because Quran contains al-muhkam solid verses and allegorical verses okay the holy book of Quran so we're talking about solid and strong in its meaning verses that we have to refer actually our narrations, doubtful narr narrations to it, to make comparison between those narrations and the Holy Book of Allah. <clears throat> and of course, by time, we're going to add up on our strong and solid verses because by time, by reading more narrations, by actually focusing and thinking more about the Holy Book of Allah and its verses, uh, we will actually add up more strong verses that we can refer a hadith to it. Okay. So this is not an easy task, of course. And that's why Ahlul Bayt used to talk to scholars, those who are knowledgeable, such as Zurara, such as Muhammad ibn Muslim, such as Abu Basir, <coughs> such as Al Bazanti, such as Abdullah ibn Sinan. And they used to teach them how they have to distinguish between authentic and non authentic hadith. 
So of course they have to be knowledgeable. They have to have some knowledge of Quran. They have to have some knowledge of Ahlul Bayt السلام, Well, give a hadith, a hadith of Ahlul Bayt السلام, to someone who is not Muslim. Or if he just uh, actually um, adopt Islam, adopted Islam just recently. Give him a hadith and tell him, okay, go and make comparison between these hadith and the Holy Book of Allah. He cannot do that, of course, because he doesn't have enough knowledge to do that. <clears throat> it's like actually distinguishing between actually placebo uh, uh, medicine, so-called, and 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 and, and real medicine. Can normal person do that no of course you need to be a technician you need to be a doctor you need to be a scientist to do that or if you can just someone gives you a hundred dollars notes and tells you okay can you distinguish between uh, whether this is fake or forged or uh, let's say um, real hundred dollars notes if it's not your business you cannot distinguish between uh, real and fake or forged uh, $100 notes. Especially, let's say, uh, notes of countries that you don't know. I'm not sure if you have seen the um, uh, <coughs> money and notes of, let's say, Venezuela. If someone gives you a note of Venezuela's money and tells you distinguish and try to test that whether it's real or fake you don't know I don't know that's hard or even if you want to bring uh, a better example a North Korean's money the country that we don't know a lot about <clears throat> it's very hard for us to distinguish uh, between uh, the, the real money of it and the forged money. So we need to be knowledgeable. We need to be uh, actually uh, people who have actually enough knowledge and ability to distinguish between authentic and non-authentic hadith. So, <clears throat> by saying that, uh, we can come to a conclusion, brothers and sisters, that what Ahlul Bayt said, they targeted their companions and scholars in the era that, on that era, people use actually to fabricate, to make a hadith, to lie upon the Prophet and his progenies. And that's why Ahlul Bayt put their efforts to distinguish between authentic and non-authentic hadith as if a government let's say uh, sees that people are forging its money they will put uh, 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 their efforts to 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 actually distinguish between forged and real money and authentic money why because their credibility will be at risk if if, if actually uh, uh, people uh, forge their monies. The economy might collapse. They will lose their credibility. That's what Ahlul Bayt did. Because what Ahlul Bayt had is their ahadith. And they actually focus on their ahadith. And say that their ahadith are the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why when people start actually to target the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt Ahlul Bayt start to defend their knowledge and give actually instruments to their companions, to scholars that they can use to distinguish between actually authentic and fabricated hadith. And Ahlul Bayt's companions and scholars did that. So we cannot say that the book of Kafi contains too many fabricated hadith. If someone says that, he's really ignorant. Is really ignorant. This is the first thing. The second thing, because we need to be knowledgeable and scholars, 
to be able to distinguish actually between authentic and non-authentic hadith. That's why, brothers and sisters, uh, a normal person who is not knowledgeable, who is not uh, professional in, in this field, uh, is not allowed actually to, to reject a hadith. Unless under uh, one actually uh, category that I'll, I'll explain to you. So when you would see people saying that no, Usul al Kafi or Bahar al Noir contains too many fake hadiths, straight away to come, you have to come to a conclusion that this person is ignorant. His idea and theory is so naive that it, it, it's not worth it for you to just go and confront him and debate him. Why? Because he's so ignorant. Just leave him or leave her. Because we face every day, we as scholars, face every day people who actually try to put doubt in our hadith. And this is wrong. This is wrong. I'm not saying that whatever has been mentioned in Usul al Kaf is 100% correct and authentic, no. But the view that we have to have about these books, we have to be optimistic, not pessimistic. We have in general to accept its ahadith, not to reject its ahadith unless proven otherwise, no. We have to accept the hadith of these books unless proven otherwise. This is what I wanted to tell you as conclusion. And then, Ahlul Bayt mentioned a method for normal people. Normal, when I say normal, so they say it in general to those who are knowledgeable and those. Uh, who, who actually are ignorant, they, they don't have any knowledge, but they are sincere in their way. They give us a procedure that we have to follow to uh, be able to accept a hadith or not to reject. So acceptance and not applying it in our everyday life. So not rejecting the hadith, accepting means applying a hadith in our everyday life or if we if we uh, don't see under what Ahlul Bayt told us that we can accept those hadith we have to actually avoid applying those hadith in our everyday lives nothing more than that and I'm pretty sure that you have heard some of these hadith when Imam al-Baqir states actually I forgot to bring my glasses just allow me to bring my glasses so I can read it better for you yeah now it's better so Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam states, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Inna haditha Muhammadin Sa'abun mustasab La yu'minu bihi illa malakun muqarrab Aw nabiyun mursal aw abdun imtahanallah Qalbahu al-Iman The hadith of Ahlul Bayt are not only hard to comprehend but people as well Treat them as hard to comprehend. Sa'bun, mustasab. Sa'b means hard to comprehend. Mustasab means that people treat them as hard to comprehend. So no one can bear the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt unless if he is Malakun Muqarra, a high rank angel, or Nabi al Mursal, a prophet who has been sent to guide his nations. So there is difference between prophets who hasn't been sent yet to guide actually the nation and prophet 
who has been sent to guide the nation. It's like if you have a driver's license, but you don't have the, the experience to drive, let's say, um, in, in highways. You're still a driver, but you're not a professional driver. So Nabi Yon Morsed, a prophet who has been sent, experienced Almighty God's knowledge, or experience uh, his duty between the uh, community and spreading the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Nabi and Mursal, and it's different between these two types, isn't it? Our Abdun, Imtahanullah, Qalbahu lil Imam. He doesn't have to be a prophet or an, an, an angel. No, no, no. He can be a slave of Allah, a servant of Allah. Whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested, actually, his heart. Imtahanullah, Qalbahu lil Iman. He has been tested and tested and tested, and his, his, his rank has been elevated and elevated and elevated. Okay. Then, Al-Imam uh, says that the Prophet said, Al-Imam al-Baqir, that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَمَا وَرَدَ عَلَيْكُمْ Then, any hadith reaches you, فَمَا This fa is very important. So because Ahlul Bayt's ahadith uh, are, are very hard to comprehend and understand and accept, so whenever a hadith reaches you, okay, what should you do with that hadith? فَمَا وَرَدَ عَلَيْكُمْ مَنْ حَدِيثِ آلِ مُحَمَّدٍ عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْلَهُ صَلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ فَلَانَتْ لَهُ قُلُوبُكُمْ وَعَرِكْتُمُهُ فَقْبَلُهُ If you see that hadith, that okay, I can accept this hadith. This is so true. I can understand its meaning. Yeah. Very nice hadith. Yeah, I can understand that. When Ahl Bayt talk about greed, yes, yes, I can understand that. When they talk about not being arrogant, yes, I can understand that. Because, because I used to actually to work in a company and the boss used to oppress me. He used to be an arrogant person. Okay? I can understand that. Yeah, correct. Very nice. You feel that it touches you. I don't know, I've seen in the discussion group, sometimes people uh, and students and pupil actually put some ahadith and some others say, yeah, yeah, it touches me, yeah. It's very nice. It's mean lanat Because sometimes ahadith uh, of Ahlul Bayt touch our hearts. So if you see that this is something very re realistic, it's not hard to digest or understand or comprehend. Just, okay, accept that. However, if you see a hadith that you cannot comprehend for any reason, you see, it's hard to, to be comprehended. It's hard to, di to be digested. It's hard for you to understand that hadith. Should you reject that hadith? No, farudduh Allah. Say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. I don't know. Maybe it's correct. Maybe it's incorrect. Maybe it's authentic. Maybe it's not authentic. So if a hadith doesn't touch your heart, of course, you don't have to apply that hadith in your life. However, you are not allowed to reject it. Farudduh Allah. Wa ila rasul wa ila al-alim min ali Muhammad alayhi wa sallam. And refer it back to the Prophet and refer it back to the Alim of Al Muhammad, Ahlul Bayt. Why? Because those who will, will actually. Uh, Halik means someone who, who, who actually will end up in hell. So, so, see how sensitive the Prophet is about Ahlul Bayt's narrations. Yeah. When he hear and listen to a narration that he cannot understand, the video is pausing. Everything is okay. 
好不好？曾经谢谢你。Slide me. What about now? Okay, allow me to just change the setting. What about now? Okay. Okay, so I just send change the setting. It should be okay now. So, okay, should we continue? Yeah, Brother Ali? Yeah? Somebody else? Okay. Inna mal halik. Alhamdulillah. Inna mal halik. Ay yu hadda. Bi shayin minh la yahtamiluhu. Fayakul, wallahi ma kana hadha shayin wal inkaruhu al kafr. It will end up in hell. It will end up in hell. A person whom if he he a hadith that he cannot understand cannot comprehend he reject that hadith definitely al inkar rejections means disbelieving rejections means disbelieving and this is important so what ahl al-bayt alayhi salam are saying uh, is that the internet connection should be good here for sure anyway let's continue anyway uh, I'm recording uh, the session we can uh, upload it later I will continue my um, lesson so just focus on the conclusion um, so, if we hear a narration that we cannot comprehend, actually, brothers and sisters, and also, uh, not only we cannot comprehend, we see that probably this is, this is uh, not that logical. That's why we cannot comprehend. Of course, sometimes we hear things that contradict our, our intellect, that's something else. We see that some, some. Sunni narrators that bring narrations that the Prophet used to be like that or Almighty God is like that. Of course, we're going to reject those ahadith without any doubt. However, about those ahadith that we cannot comprehend, brothers and sisters, okay, and we don't have any uh, any fundamental problem with those ahadith. We are not allowed to apply them in our everyday life. However, we are not allowed to reject them. Let me give you an example of Quran. Too many verses in Quran we have that if we hear and listen, we might say that this is not that logical. We cannot comprehend that. For instance, Almighty God ordered his prophet Ibrahim to kill his son Ismail. How? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him in a dream that he has to do that. Ya Bunayya. إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أَذْبَحُكَ It's in Surah Al-Safat, I believe. فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى So I've seen in the dream that I have to kill you. What do you think? قَالَ يَا أَبَتِ فَعَلْ مَا تُعْمَرْ Oh Father, do as you are ordered. سَتَجِدُنِي إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ You will find me a patient boy. Okay? إن شَاءَ اللَّهُ If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. So what I'm trying to say is that, so if, if, if let's say, someone who is not uh, knowledgeable or who is not a Muslim guy, if he reads this, the translation or this verse, you say that this is oppression, we cannot accept that. But we as Muslim, how we treat this verse, even if we don't understand it, because we accept the whole concept of Quran. We say, okay, this is an allegorical verse. I cannot, uh, I cannot apply it in my life. I cannot say, okay, 
this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said because I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a tyrant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a wise. So, so, so uh, the only thing is I cannot understand it. That's it. I will believe in that as verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although I don't know that the exact meaning of that. And this is very important. So I'm not going to reject it, but I cannot accept it by applying it in my everyday life. Of course, when we go to Ahlul Bayt they explain that to us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or scholars, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders Ibrahim, he wanted to test Ibrahim. He didn't want him to kill his son, but he wanted to tell him that you have to prepare yourself to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you. So Almighty God's orders wasn't to, to wasn't targeting Ibrahim to kill his son. Rather, it was targeting Ibrahim to do uh, to prepare himself to do that. Of course, with this meaning, uh, we can accept the meaning of this verse is going to be a strong and its meaning verse a muhkam min al-ayat. Let me give you another, another example, brothers and sisters. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states to Khidr, when Ibrahim joined Khidr so he can learn from him. So three things happened to them. The first thing was that they uh, actually they, 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 they traveled by boat and 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 uh, Khidr actually wrecked that boat, made a hole in that boat. Musa was so actually uh, angry about that. What are you doing, man? He said, Alam lam sabra. I told you that you cannot that you cannot be patient with me. And then the second thing that happened, they saw Ghulam. And Khidr went and killed that Ghulam. Oh man, for a prophet of God to kill an innocent, a beautiful boy. Okay. This is this is very, very inappropriate. And that's why Prophet Musa said, okay, atalta nafsan bagayda nafs. Why you kill that boy? And the third thing, they entered a city. They asked people of that city to host them, and they did it. So they slept on the street. And then they saw a wall collapsing. Khadr told Musa, okay, let's, let's, let's actually try to uh, fix this wall. And they did. He said, okay, it was very appropriate for you, O Khadr, to go and collect some money for what we did. So now we have to separate. And I'll explain to you what happens. As for the boat, there were a king, a tyrant king. He used to actually confiscate and take any good vessels and boats and that's why i actually made that hole in that boat so it can stays under the hand of those poor people so they're going to fix it but going to stand within the reach and about that ghulam what about the ghulam okay that boy ghulam when we hear ghulam it means what straight away comes to our mind it's a boy but it's not a boy Ghulam is a man. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states uh, in the Quran that Khidr told Musa that he has got parents who are very good people. Khashina and Yurhiquma Kufra. We 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 actually we wanted to show our mercy to his parents. Why? Because he is bothering them. Yurhiquma kufra. It means that he's an infidel person. Of course, you're not going to call a boy a non believer or infidel. No, no. What are you going to say about him? It's a boy. It's a kid. So when you say that he's infidel, 
is bothering his parents. It means that he's a non-believer. So why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stakes his ghulam? Probably he was a, a young man. He wasn't a child. He was a kafir. He did too many sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't show his mercy towards him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave those parents 70 prophets. 70 prophets actually came out of their lineage. 70. That's as a return to what they lost. So he was actually that ulam. Uh, he has put himself in a situation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered one of his servant to kill him because he deserved to be killed. He did too many bad things. Probably he killed people. We don't know. kufra. And as for the wall, there are some explanations as well. So what I'm trying to say, even in Quran, we have too many verses that so when we hear and listen or read actually we might not be able to understand and comprehend it fully and that's why we have to accept it as verse of Allah as words of Allah but we cannot actually apply those verses in our lives too many verses the same thing should be applied upon Ahlul Bayt's narrations and the prophet's narrations if you hear something and that you see that it doesn't actually contradicts wisdom if it does contradict wisdom of course we're not going to accept it well if it doesn't contradict wisdom it doesn't contradicts main concept of quran main concept of ahlul bayt's ahadi authentic ahadi yet we see that we cannot comprehend it what would you how should we treat that hadith we don't have to accept it as applying it in our everyday lives. But we are not allowed actually to reject it. So there is a huge or big distance and room between accepting and rejecting. We cannot just simply reject any hadith that we cannot comprehend or understand. No. We have to put it aside until maybe one day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the permission for us to understand and comprehend that hadith. And this is important, brothers and sisters. So, Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, or the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam gave us, uh, an gave us an instrument that we can use to distinguish between those hadith who we can apply, those hadith which we can apply in our everyday lives, and those are hadith that we don't have to apply them because we cannot understand them. And too many of Ahlul Bayt's hadith we can understand and comprehend and apply in our everyday lives. Too many, thousands of them. We can read a hadith of Ahlul Bayt and apply them because we can comprehend them. When they talk about akhlaq, when they talk about behaving ourselves, when they talk about how we should our treat our parents, our kids, our families, how we should do Salat al-Rahim, how we should be patient, how we should be brave, how we should be generous. These are a hadith that we can understand and comprehend. Thousands of them we can apply. Yes, sometimes we might face a hadith that we cannot understand, as we might face verses in the Holy Book of Allah that we cannot understand. We have to put them aside until we understand them or not understand them we are not allowed to reject them this is the main point brothers and sisters let's see what i have for you more what time is it still you can hear me or not yeah Sometimes, if we live in the era of Ahlul Bayt, sometimes we see that 
one imam says something and the other imam says something else. For instance, Imam al Hassan says that we have to enter a peace agreement with Muawiyah, while we see Imam al Hussein saying that we have to revolt against Yazid. Which one should we accept? It depends. It depends on the era that we live in. If we live in the era of Imam al Hassan, we have to see what Imam al Hassan says. If we live in the era of Imam Hussein, we have to follow the footsteps of Imam Hussein. Of course, Imam Hassan won't say that there is no God but Allah, and then Imam Hussein comes and says that there is more than a God. No. We might actually uh, think that there is contradiction between Ahlul Bayt's ahadith themselves uh, when we see an Imam saying something and the other Imam saying something else. For instance, a person saw Imam Sadiq wearing a good clothes, wealthy clothes. He said, okay, oh Imam Sadiq, you are, look at what you are wearing. You are the grandson of the Prophet, yet you are wearing that. Imam Sadiq replied, do you know what is the difference between me and Ali ibn Ali Talib, the commander of the faithful? He said, what is the difference between you two? He said, yes, Ali ibn Abi Talib used to be the ruler. And that's why he used to be so humble, wearing as the most poor person was in the country under his government. But I am not the ruler. So I don't have to be that tough upon myself. So is there any contradictions actually between the commander of the faithful's uh, behavior and actions and Imam Sadiq's actions? No. No contradictions. Because the circumstances are different. And that's why Ahlul Bayt say, for an, an actually order their companions to take the last orders they have. Such as, look at this narration, and we have too many narrations like that. And Imam Sadiq states, all of these narrations are from the volume 2 of Bihar al Anwar very valuable book the volume 2 of Bihar uh, to be uh, it gives us actually um, a clear way how we should treat narrations Imam Sadaq states he told one of his companions so Let's assume you come to me the previous year and I tell you something to do. And you come me to me this year and I tell you to do something else. Which one would you take and apply in your life? He said, of course. The last one. Imam Sadaq said, Rahimakallah, you are correct. You are correct. Why? Because circumstances change let's say al imam al sadiq in the era or let's say imam al imam zain al abidin in the era of yazid acts differently from him acting in the era of the other khalifa different circumstances of course as imam al imam al salam when he was in the era of Muawiyah, he didn't revolt against Muawiyah. He respected the peace treatment between Muawiyah and Imam Hassan al-Mushtaq. But after Muawiyah entered hell, Allah Imam al Hussein revolted against it. Is there any contradictions between Imam al Hussein's actions while he was in the era of Muawiyah and while he was in the era of Yazid? No, because the circumstances changed. So sometimes, what I'm trying to say, sometimes contradictions we might see in Ahadith, they are actually not contradictions. They are in accordance to specific circumstances. Should we use taqiyya or should we not? Should we fast, mustahab fasting 
Should we not? Should we do this? Should we not? Should we enter to help governments? Should we not? For instance, in the era of Abbasis, Al-Imam Musa ibn Ja'far ordered one of his greatest companions, uh, Ali ibn Yaqtin, Ali ibn Yaqtin, one of Imam Sadiq, Imam al Musa ibn Ja'far and Imam al radas great companions. He ordered him to be the minister of Harun al-Rashid. Minister of Harun al-Rashid? Yes. They used to have only one minister. Under conditions, of course. He told him, any Shia comes to you, you have to help him. You're not allowed to reject him at all. At all. So, in the era of Abbasis, Ahlul Bayt ordered some of their companions to work with Abbasis to help people. But in the era of Amawis, I'm not sure whether Ahlul Bayt Amsam ordered some of their companions to work with them. Because it's different circumstances, just different atmospheres. And that's why probably they haven't ordered their companions to work with Umayyad, Bani Umayyad. But they ordered some of their companions to work with Bani Abbas. Although there is no difference between Bani Abbas and Bani Umayyad, both of them are tyrants, both of them are killers, both of them are oppressors, both of them will end up in hell. Of course, in different, probably, places. But same, Allah. So, different circumstances might cause different narrations not in our fundamental ahadith no no of course not but usually in in applying a hadith in our everyday actions such as using taqiyya or not working with this guy or not working at this work or not and etc Okay, it's already 47 minutes, so let's stop here and take some questions, whether it's relevant to our class or whether it's uh, about other things. We'll try to answer your question if we know, inshallah. Okay, so I just want to make sure. Uh, that you were able to hear the listen clearly I'm not talking about the picture or the video so did you understand the lesson or not Recording in progress. So I just found the problem. Yeah. I just found the problem. The problem is, the problem was that actually the, the VPN was running by itself without me ordering it to run. So it was on, and that's why we faced problems. So I just shut it down. It should be okay now. It's a little bit late. Is it okay? Yeah, okay. Too late. <laughs> okay. That's okay. As long as we we're fixing it, we found the problem. So it's gonna be okay for our next lessons. Uh, let's take some questions. Alaikum sarahatullah. 
with dua for your success and long life for you and your families. Thank you. Would it be possible to have a case study to implement the concept we have learned so far? Such as the issue of Shahadaya Salaseh in Tashakkud, you mean, I believe, of Salat. <laughs> it is a very continuous issue in our community with numerous ahadith put forth by. Let me give you an, a very nice uh, story about Shahadaya Salaseh. Once an Indian guy in Kuwait, I was reciting Majalis in Kuwait, uh, a Sayyid, he's a very good one, very pious person, came to me and said, I've got some questions for you. I said, okay, let's have a chat with you. He said, what's wrong with mentioning the commander of the faithful in our tashahud? I told him, we are mentioning him. He said, where? I told him, why should I know Muhammad and Abdul Rasul? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Correct or not? Correct. Just answer me. Yeah. He said, no. No. He then said, why some scholars say that you will invalidate your praise if you mention the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib specifically? I said, listen, I cannot answer you on their behalf, but I'll tell you the answer for that, because Salat should be prayed as the Prophet prayed it. We are not allowed to add anything, even if it's correct, unless if the Prophet did it. Of course, we have some scholars say, وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولَ اللَّهُ صلى الله أشهد أن محمد عبد رسول الله وأن عليا probably ولي الله وأن عليا خليفة الله something we have narration if we say that some scholars I believe say if we say what Imam Sadiq عليه السلام for instance said it's okay and 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 then he started to debate me he said okay if you go to heaven you ring the bell of heaven what is the ring of the bell of heaven I said just tell me he said it's gonna the bell will ring as this, will ring as this. Ash, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, Ali and I said, okay. He said, okay, what has been written on the arsh of Ar Rahman, on the throne of God? I said, you tell me. He said, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, Ali and He brought too many narrations to me trying to convince me that the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib is alongside with the name of Allah and the Prophet So everywhere you can find these three names. Why in Tashahud we will have only two names? <laughs> Actually it was convincing but uh, at the end of the day um, we should follow the footsteps for Ahl al-Bayt probably it's for Taqiyya or other thing, we should follow the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt uh, uh, So, um, yeah, he wasn't convinced anyway. Although he used to follow that scholar that he used to say, who, who says actually that uh, if we mention the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib in our tashahud, we're going to invalidate our praise. I'm not sure what he's doing, why he wasn't convinced. But he brought too many narrations to me. And I was so happy with those narrations, actually. Uh, I don't mind to do it. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, we will do what Ahlul Bayt uh, tell us exactly without adding anything more to it. If they tell us that you have to mention the name of all Ahlul Bayt in Tashahud, we will do as they order. If they say, no, don't say it, we're not going to say it. We will follow the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt So as for the first question, I'm not sure whether I'm very convincing or not, um, but uh, this is what comes to my mind, and this is the story that I shared with you.
the other question. Alaikum warahmatullah. Can you please tell the admin to upload last week's classes? Yes, I did already actually. I was asked and I talked to his eminent Sayyid Hussein and he said he will talk to um, the team uh, to upload uh, those classes. Uh, Inshallah ta'ala. Sister Zainab alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. So you mentioned, Sayyid, that our mind can't comprehend it. Isn't our mind too weak to comprehend the words of God or Ahl Bayt anyway? So, yes. Our mind is so weak to comprehend unless if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the ability. Yes. So by ourselves, we cannot. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, we can. Was Khidr a prophet? Some says yes. Some people say that he used to be a prophet. I thought he was a well knowledgeable man. Probably Luqman was a knowledgeable man, wise man. But Khidr probably was prophet. Yeah. A chapter of a question. Okay, I have to read. Okay. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Since I did not attend pre Hausa and joined this Ramadan I'm not clear on how we are tested on what we have learned during this course kindly provide guidance in this regard you have to ask the admin because I can talk on my behalf about myself about my class if someone attends my classes if he listens to my classes if he comprehends what we said in our classes uh, anyway I will give him the um, mark if he participates if my, in my classes, if he actually uh, or she actually does the, the assignment I ask. Uh, so I'm not going to test uh, my students. As I said, I'm, I'm not with that people who think that we have to test students in Hausa. No. Uh, I see it it's um, not that appropriate. Trust is between us and you, uh, and uh, Allah is watching us anyway. So if someone attends our classes, my classes, um, I will give him the full mark. And that full mark means 100. Yes, not 99, 100. Uh, I don't mind. <clears throat> um, if someone comes to me and says, tells me, and I know that he was attending, he, that I comprehended your classes and things like that, I will give him the full mark. I will trust him. Uh, I'm not sure about how said Mahdi will deal with you. You have to ask him. He might have a different opinion. Yeah, we debated that. Uh, but uh, uh, this is how I will do with you. Yeah, said Mahdi is a tough guy. Study for his classes. <laughs> okay, let's come to that. The new paragraph. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's a story. Okay. It's about nafs. What can I do if I have a weakness in me about having bad thoughts of others? Such as comment. It says to me and then for the next few days I just think of that comment and having bad thought of the person who said it to me and things like that, okay. I feel that takes away my from my spirituality and connection with Allah. Of course, you are very right. I promise to myself I will stop this weakness in me since Ramadan. But it seems I'm still repeating it. And fear God will not accept from me anyone okay what can i do okay i'm not sure if i i think i've told you that his eminence said hussein wrote a whole book called hadith on nafs it's substantial i don't know it's about probably 800 pages he gathered narrations of ahlul bayt on that book 
and uh, uh, I've, I've actually read some part of it. It's a very nice book. As for nafs, we have to treat ourselves. Sometimes we have to lower ourselves. Sometimes we have to trick ourselves. Trick yourself. Do not always push yourself. Just for instance, Allahumma ni'audu bikum min al-kasali wa dajari kasali. Do not be lazy. Be active. If you just lay down on the bed, of course thoughts uh, might come, might invade you. But if you got works to do, reciting Quran, reading narrations, listening to speeches, helping others, just try to be active, I think. Because Ahlul Bayt didn't want us to just lay down and try to actually uh, be on social security and have, try to have uh, too much space in our lives, too much spare time in our lives. No. Work as you get exhausted. I've got some friends that they say we work a lot that we got exhausted. It's excellent. Thank God for that. So you get exhausted, you sleep well. If you don't uh, got exhausted, you're not going to be able to sleep well. Okay? So exhaustions equals good sleeping. Having works, things to do, equals not being able to think bad about people. And sometimes uh, we might need uh, to seek consultations of doctors because it's not only the problem in our soul, but rather it's in our body. Uh, we, we might lose some enzymes in our bloods and things like that that we need to take tablets for that. And we're not going to be psycho if we do that. Believe me. Uh, science has proven that. Uh, we have to act rationally to what we face. Sometimes, because uh, I, I'm, I'm getting too was, was of things. When someone tells me, wow, he just stared at me. Okay. He didn't say salam to me. Okay. You're so sensitive. Probably you need treatment. It depends. It depends. So that question you can ask Sir Hassan. I'm pretty sure he might be able to talk for an hour to you. If you need more, actually, uh, in depth answer. In the pre hausa classes, one of the teachers mentioned that it's makruh to eat outside. Okay, if that is the case, can we bring takeaway food so that we are not dining in the restaurant? Who said it's makruh to eat outside? It's makruh to eat while you are walking. I haven't heard that it's makruh to eat outside. I eat outside. I don't mind if you, someone of you invites me to a restaurant, halal one. I will go definitely. Okay. It's not my cool. Don't tell me that was Sir Hussain. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. We're not backbiting him. He's a cool man. I'm just waiting for him to invite me. Okay. So it's not macro. Yeah, it's not macro. I haven't heard about that. I'm not sure I haven't heard about that. Yes, it's macro for you to eat while you are walking. Okay, some might ask, okay, while we are driving, are we allowed to eat? Well, if you're in Australia, don't do it because you will get a fine. If you drink, drive, even if you drink water. If you eat, drive, even if you eat a donut. You will be fine with, I don't know, $350, something like that. And you will lose some points of your license. Uh, so um, don't do it. <laughs> it's not macro, but it's illegal. <laughs> yeah, because driving is not walking. OK, 
Assalamu alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Too many anonymous people asking question. What if they're contradictory hadith and there is no obvious verse uh, in the Quran that can match the hadith? Okay, we'll talk about that. That's a good question. Because sometimes if we cannot find, of course there is a verse in the Quran, but if we cannot find, we have to go to the next step. If you cannot, Ahl al-Bayt states, if you cannot find a verse that you can com make comparison between the hadith that you are doubtful about and the verse, just go to the next step, see what Am Sunnis say about this occasion, this specific, for instance, uh, hadith. Of course, if you see two hadith contradicting each other, one say you have to do it and the other say don't, don't do it. We will go to Quran, we will make comparison between these two hadith and Quran. If we cannot find any verse suitable to make comparison between these two hadith and Quran, we'll go to the next step that we'll see which hadith of these two is closer to Sunnis, we will take the other side. Why? Because actually they opened the shop against Ahlul Bayt so they usually try to, to actually contradict Ahlul Bayt. That's why if you take the other side, you will uh, actually uh, be more on the safe side. That's what we will talk about, inshallah. Alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. We read in Quran. Yeah, what we read in Quran? We read in Quran, yes. Can we gift the thawab to Imam al-Mahdi as well of as well as our deceased grandparents and relatives or we shouldn't do both? You know what you can do? I always do do it like that. I will read it in my parents' behalf, in my deceased people's behalf, on Umm al Banin's behalf, and 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 what I'm gonna do, read it in behalf of them and uh, gift it to Imam al Mahdi. Salam. So I'm not doing it to them, I'm doing it in behalf of them and giving the thawab to Imam al Mahdi. Something like that. So this is you can have both sides. What if there are contradicting hadith and both can give? What? Itma'inam to the mu'mineen. And that's a very good question as well. Although you are anonymous, but you are knowledgeable, man. If, if, if we receive two hadith, okay, both of them from scholars, from Zurara and Abu Basir, and we see contradictions between those two hadith, and both of them told us, just do it. That means that it's muwassa'un alayk. You can do either one. You can do what Zurara said, and you can do what Abu Basir says. And we have some, too many narrations about that. Uh, we'll bring inshallah. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Sister Zainab Sulaiman. As you refer to the incident of the Prophet Ibrahim and the proposed sacrifice of his son, Prophet Ismail, could you please throw some light on what happened during the attempt of to sacrifice Prophet Ismail, especially the part where Prophet Ibrahim was trying to make the sacrifice, as I'm a little unsure about the event. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Listen, Almighty God as God, this is my belief, He's a God. As he orders, listen careful. I'd like you to listen careful. As he orders his angel, Azrael, to confiscate people's soul, he can order some other people to do the same thing. Can't he? He's God. He gave the permission to Azrael 
to take out people's soul. He can give that permission to any of his prophets to take out people's soul. Can't he? He can. He can. So the first thing scholars say that Prophet Ibrahim was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to kill Ismail, but he wanted to test him whether he's willing to do so or not. Okay. Let's say that Prophet Ibrahim was ordered by Allah to kill actually Ismail. Would Allah be a, an oppressor? Of course not. He's God. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders angel Israel to, to, to confiscate and to take out the soul of people. Can we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is oppressor? Jalat Sahatu Qudsi? Of course not. Of course we cannot say that. So because he's God, and he's got rules, he's not oppressing us. Of course that is very hard. To order a father to kill his son, yes, it's very hard. But he's God. When he's got point, he can do that. But he didn't do it. Well, let's assume... If he was really asking Ibrahim to kill, and then he changed his decree, Qabla al Qadr, is that possible? Yes, it's possible. He's God, man. He's God. And that's why prophets fear God. Because sometimes he's not in a closed angle that he cannot do but one thing. More than 99% of occasions, he can do either ways. He can use his mercy or he can punish people. Cannot he? Of course he can. Because he's God. And what happened there? So Prophet Ibrahim tried. And the knife was, wasn't cutting off the throat. Prophet Ibrahim got so upset, like talked, what's happening to this knife? The knife talked, Al Khalilu Ya'muruni Wal Jalilu Yanhani. Khalil Ar Rahman, ordering me, but Almighty God, Almighty God ordered me something else. And actually, what happened to Ibrahim? When Ibrahim heard and listened to what will happen to Imam Hussein and that Imam Hussein will sacrifice all of his sons in the way of Allah. He said, I wish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me a son that I sacrifice him in his way. And that's why when he wasn't able to do that, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want him to do that, he actually got upset. He said, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I wanted to fulfill, or I wanted to actually uh, apply your orders on my actions. And he got so upset and he cried for Imam al Hussein. When he cried for Imam al Hussein, this is a narration, brothers and sisters. Angel Jibreel descended on him. He said, you are crying for Imam al Hussein? He said, yes. I'm so upset for Imam al Hussein. He said, okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing to you. I will use your upset for Imam al Hussein as if you were killing your son with your own hand. I will consider that as if you did that. This is how valuable is feeling the sour in our hearts for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Yeah, we're getting close to Muharram. The month that we have to weep and cry and beat our chests and heads for what happened to our beloved Imam and Imam al Hussein and his progenies and companions. Say it. 
Your new glasses look amazing. Thank you. Yeah. This is the glass. Glasses that my kids have chosen to me or for me. I was feeling very uncomfortable during reading, so I went to the doctor. He said, Yeah, you need to wear glasses for sure. You're bothering yourself. Uh, so only for reading. It is illegal. Doesn't mean it's haram. Or some maraja say we can't break the law. Yes, some maraja say we cannot break the law. So it's not haram by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's haram uh, because it might affect people. Haram thanawi, they call it. Yeah, but of course, because it's gonna be chaos. Watching everyone <laughs> eating and drinking and smoking shisha and argila while they are driving. You know, the police people, if they leave people do as they desire, people doesn't mind actually to even smoke argila while they are driving, as, as if I, I have seen people doing that. So that's very dangerous, brothers and sisters. So we have to abide by laws, especially those laws that can help everyone, can help all people. Okay, we have some clarifications. A teacher, esteemed teacher, saying that when I say it's makru to eat outside, I mean while you are in shopping center. And that's something else. Yes, eating in shopping center is something else. Walking or in shopping center, it's not a restaurant, in shopping center. So probably it means that while you are walking, because shopping center back then, they didn't have dining place for people to eat, or probably, I don't know, probably some scholars believe that eating in shopping center is, is, is inappropriate, especially for ladies and things like that. Yeah, that's possible, very possible. But eating in a restaurant and having a good cup of tea after that especially if someone invites you to do so that's very pleasant alaikum salam wa rahmatullah before i renewed my shahadatain i used to neglect neglect my salat and even some of my actions were very questionable. But soon after renewing my shahadatain, I have been constantly fulfilling my salat. Do I have to do the qada of the salat that I missed when I was misled by the Sunni madhab? Maybe we have to put, uh, we have to ask this, your question from a marja, because it's, it's a very specific one. We have to ask, uh, usually, yes, yes, you have to, but it depends. Probably uh, some scholars might say, no, you don't have to because uh, you are not, uh, Ahl Bayti, you are not Shia. So, and then when you became Shia, uh, probably you you uh, you tried your best to pray praise as Ahl Bayt Salam pray. So you don't have to do a lot of those prayers that you missed while you were Sunni. Probably. So we have to. If you can ask His Eminence Sayyid Muhammad Kawam to ask some scholars this question, it would be very appropriate. If uh, in any way he uh, wasn't able to do so just please inform me and I will do it for you <sighs> yeah there was this was the last question so 16 questions we took today it's already one hour one hour and 20 minutes yeah so if you have any other question I'm happy to answer if I know 
If you don't have, I can just release you, brothers and sisters. I know I took too much of your time. Uh, as for me, um, I can talk. So, yeah. Another question. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah, sister. The hadith that talk about acquiring knowledge and it being an obligation to on every Muslim. Talab al ilm faridah ala kulli Muslim wa Muslim. Is it referring to all kind of religious knowledge because the subject are vast? Is it specific to aqaid? Or does it include jurisprudential hadith? It includes at least everything that we need. And actually, in some of uh, those hadith, the Prophet says, The knowledge of knowing yourself. Knowing yourself that you are the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you have got a creator. I can recall that one of my teachers, His Eminence Al-Allama Sheikh Baqir Alam Al-Huda Rahmatullahi Alayhi used to explain this hadith in this way because it says وَهُوَ عَلْمُ الْأَنفُسِ However, anything that we need, of course we need to pray, of course we have to know how to pray. We need to go to Hajj, we, know how, we have to know how to should do Hajj. We need to trade Al-Fiqh Qabla Al-Majjah. Before you buy any cryptocurrency, Okay. While well, it's saying it's going up, the prices are rising. Not now. Before you do that, you have to ask your scholar, your merger, are you allowed to do so or not? So sometimes, if I need, yes. If things that I don't need, if you say that uh, things that I won't be actually uh, in touch with it, it's recommended for us to learn those things if they are in our hari, but it's not wajib. Ahsantum, thank you very much. Please stay safe and take care. Is there any other question as well? We have two questions. How should our way of life be from morning till we sleep? Can we please share experience from your student life? I'm sure we can learn a lot from your lifestyle. Well, I'm not that sure. I was a lazy man. <sighs> so then take me as a role model. Talk to his eminence, Sayyid Hussein and Sayyid Mustafa. They're much better than me. Uh, and his eminence, Sayyid Mahdi as well. And the rest. The hadith that says that if Abu Dhar and you لو علم أبو Dhar ما في قلب سلم he would kill him. What does it mean? <laughs> this is one of those hadith that we cannot understand. Okay, we're not going to apply it. We're going to put it aside. When Imam Mahdi reappears, we're going to ask him, what does this hadith mean? Okay, for sure, this is one of those hadith that we cannot comprehend and understand. We're not going to deny it, reject it, but we cannot understand it. I mean, I cannot understand it. It's hard hadith to understand. Peace be upon Salman and peace be upon Abu Dhar. But once I've heard this, just just let me give you a very nice story. I've heard it, I haven't seen it. Once Salman invited Abu Dhar. Okay. And Abu Dhar went to Salman and Salman prepared some bread to Abu Dhar. When Abu Dhar wanted to eat, Salman said, uh, yes, Abu Dhar said, I told Salman, if you have any, do you have any salt? And then Salman stood up and went out and he had something, some plates and things like that. He gave it uh, because he didn't have any money to the shop to take as a, as a amana, to take some salt off of that shop 
and he took that salt and brought it to Abu Dhar and put it in front of Abu Dhar and Abu Dhar put that salt on that bread and ate it and then Abu Dhar said Alhamdulillah al -qana'ah. that I'm so qanu Alhamdulillah I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it was then when Salman told him you are not that qanu otherwise my plate wouldn't be with the shop to bring you a salt <laughs> al qanaa means to eat the bread without the salt so of course there is different stages uh, the, the, the stage of Abu Adar is different from uh, the stage of Salman but uh, Abu Adar laqala rahimallah the narration I've seen law alima Abu Adar ma fi qalbi Salman laqala rahimallah qatala Salman if Abu Adar realizes what goes uh, in between Salman's heart he would say rahimallah qatala Salman Allah's mercy covers Salman's killers or oh, killer so yes different uh, different actually uh, stage but uh, I cannot understand that narration because I'm not in Salman's uh, for sure I'm not in Salman's level neither in I'm not in uh, about uh, level so I cannot understand what's going on it's, just, it's between them and Ahlul Bayt Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Sometimes I find myself very tired to complete my daily du'as that I assign myself. So I cut my list down and do just perhaps one or two max and try to focus on them. And then I feel guilty for being lazy. What is your advice to overcome this spiritual guilt that I sometimes experience? When I can do my maximum effort. Listen, because I know you, I'm not going to mention your name. Uh, don't feel guilty. Because we have narrations. Ahlul Bayt say, Inna lil qulub idbarun wa iqbal. Sometimes hearts come towards reality, comes towards Ahlul Bayt. Sometimes, no, they, are, they, they get tired. فَطُوبَى مَنْ كَانَ إِدْبَارُ قَلْبِهِ مَنْ خَيْرُ Okay, sometimes I feel tired. Okay, I go and talk to my sons, to my daughters, to my relatives, to my friends. Nice talking, nice chatting. What's wrong with that? Yeah, I haven't recited dua. I'm not in a crisis. Yeah, that's okay. As long as I'm not backbiting people, it's okay. So, Ahlul Bayt didn't want to they don't want us to get suffocated actually no they wanted to help us if you are tired that's okay as we have in one narration I've heard that from my one of my uncles he is my teacher as well he said that Imam Rada alayhi salam sometimes he when he used to be tired he would stay awake <coughs> only one third of Bain Abdul Rahim not the whole time and then he used to go to sleep <coughs> So it depends on your mood, it depends on your uh, body, on your soul. And too many, you don't have to feel guilt as long as you are on the right path, inshallah. So almost one and a half hour. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Muhammadin. Wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Wa salam alaykum jami'an. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma ajjil. لوليك الفرج والعافية والناس وجعلنا من أنصارك وعمرك وشيعته ومحبيه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إليه اللهم لا تحرمنا من خدمة محمد وآل محمد بحق محمد وآل محمد هذا Thank you for your attendance.